Good evening, and thank you all for being here. I'm on the cusp of taking off for a whirlwind book tour, which I'm now kind of looking forward to because of COVID. When I was locked down, I kept imagining I might be able to get out there and travel the country again. And the book, as you just heard from Randall, Silent Spring Revolution, it'll be out this um, Tuesday. And I am, um, you are my first talk I'm giving anywhere in the US. I'm doing CBS Sunday morning uh, with Jane Pauley on Sunday, and then I'm in New York and doing all the uh, shows starting with the Morning Joe on MSNBC. Um, and so I'm just honored to get to kick this off here. And of course, I'm a professor, as Randall mentioned, at Rice, so this is my own backyard right here. Um, the reason I wanted this, not just to make you look like it's a, a uh, doorstop, um, but I've been really took on as my life work a three volume presidential history of the uh, topic of the environmental movement. And my first one, The Wilderness Warrior, dealt with Theodore Roosevelt. And just so you know, the word progressive for the progressive form is really applicable here because there, it really was the progressive movement of Theodore Roosevelt's era. He was president in 1901 to 1909. And TR said that conservation was the number one issue in the United States, the managing of our natural resources, number one. He created the US Forest Service of today. If you pull a map and look at the West and see all these national forests or go to Davy Crockett National Forest that didn't exist until TR created our, our Forest Service. He created 51 federal bird reservations, which is the beginning of US fish and wildlife. Today, you all own 550 national wildlife refuges throughout the country. He started using executive power to save treasure landscapes. Theodore Roosevelt would say the French might have the Louvre, that um, you know, Britain might have Westminster Abbey, India might have Taj Mahal, but we have the Tetons, we have Yellowstone, we have Yosemite. And he went so far as stood on the rim of the Grand Canyon with former Rough Riders, men that he served with in the Spanish-American War, and Roosevelt said, do not touch it, God has made it, you will only mar it, leave the Grand Canyon alone. And the Senate moved to uh, have it mined for zinc, asbestos, and copper. And Roosevelt used an executive order declaring the entire Grand Canyon a, a federal preserve. And it, he immediately got sued and it went through the courts. But lo and behold, we have today the Grand Canyon. Figures of that era like John Muir, founder of the Sierra Club, people like Gifford Pinchot, the great scientific forester, that was the first progressive environmental movement, TR, Theodore Roosevelt. Second, I wrote about in a book called Rightful Heritage, Franklin D. Roosevelt in the Land of America. And that is, and I don't know if you realize, but Franklin Roosevelt, his entire life, when he filled out an occupation of job, he would write tree farmer. He was born on the Hudson River, grew up on the Hudson River, lived his entire life on the Hudson River. Eleanor Roosevelt said, there's no knowing my husband if you don't know the river. It was, it, the Hudson was FDR's lifeblood. And from that experience, he adds to what TR did, meaning, do you know FDR created 800 state parks? And of course, here in Texas, FDR did Big Bend, you know, and, and um, you know, he fought to save the Everglades, Great Smoky Mountains, on and on. But he also paid a dollar a day um, unemployed people to work for the Civilian Conservation Corps. And the, during FDR's New Deal, they planted nearly three billion trees and an America that had been, been destroyed by um, agriculture runoff, waste products, um, a dust bowl, our whole country. We talk about the Great Depression's not just the stock market crashed. 
our whole country had been abused, and FDR's New Deal created a second environmental movement, if you'd like. My new book's The Third Wave, and it's from 1960 to 1973. 1960, the year John F. Kennedy ran for president and won, and the year Wallace Stegner, a Pulitzer Prize-winning novelist, wrote his Wilderness Letter, the year that a famous photographer, Ansel Adams, did a book, This is the American Earth, with Nancy Newall. And it ends in 1973 when Richard Nixon, on December 28th, brings the Endangered Species Act into existence. And a bipartisan vote in the U.S. Senate, 92 to nothing. Um, so what is this third wave, and how does it come about? And we're not at the fourth wave. I know we all want to believe with climate we are. We've come near when Gore was, was did Inconvenient Truth, where you know people like Bill McKibben, who has been part of this lecture series, has been pushing for it. We're always right there and don't really pull it, pull it off. Um, I had to begin my book uh, in 1945, Hiroshima Nagasaki. Game-changing event, world history, birth of the atomic age. During World War II, anything we could do to win the war counted. And in the United States, we started mass producing all sorts of chemicals, all sorts of war materials. And of course, the nuclear bomb out of the Manhattan Project, the first bomb blowing up that we exploded in the Trinity test in New Mexico. But after Hiroshima, when the bomb dropped, only days later, a writer named Norman Cousins wrote a, a, a very popular little missive in which she said, is man obsolete? Does this atomic bomb mean the destruction of our planet? And there was fear. You know, people that were against the bomb, um, in my book I write about some, were, were, were the, meaning that did not like that we used it in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. There weren't many. Jo um, but one of them that was against it was Joe Kennedy, John F. Kennedy's father. Another was Albert Schweitzer, who would win a Nobel Prize for his work dealing with sick people in Africa. And another was Norman Cousins, who ran the Saturday Literary Review, which used to be a big deal. And out of this, it wasn't a movement really to stop or, or to worry that America didn't have nuclear weapons. We were the only nuclear monopoly. Only one time in world history does one country a nuclear monopoly. United States, 1945 to 49. We're the only one that had it, and it was a lot of pride in the United States that we did. But suddenly, scientific reports started coming in, one after the other. And this was the problem of, um, of radiation and of, and of chemicals and fallout, nuclear dust, how you're going to get a spike in cancer, leukemia, and the, right, and the rest. And that data came in, and the leading voice worried about it at first was Barry Commoner, who in 1980 ran for president for the Citizens Party, and he's largely forgotten now. But Commoner was a, a genius at science, PhD at, um, at Harvard. And during World War II, Barry Commoner was the one who would put chemicals on planes and, that would, and they would dust crop DDT to help our soldiers to make sure they didn't get malaria, meaning a chemical agent. And we pour, dump it and dump it and dump it. And Commoner's research in the 1950s, early 50s, is showing not only is nuclear fallout, we, the radiation sickness um, horrific, but the use of insecticides and pesticides like DDT T were too. Now, if we were just using our atomic bomb in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, it wouldn't have wedged into a new environmental consciousness. But alas, we started blowing up nuclear bombs willy-nilly in Nevada, one after the other, bomb after bomb after bomb. And the people that got sick from it weren't just in Nevada and Utah. It blew all across the land. We started seeing high levels of radiation and, um, um, and um, 
strontium-90 in people as far as New York. Writers like Kurt Vonnegut wrote about it early in his career. Commoner starts preaching about it as a pub public scientist with scientific information. And another person skeptical of nuclear testing, like we're doing in Nevada, was Rachel Carson. Rachel Carson was born in Springdale, Pennsylvania. She went to today what is called Chatham in Pennsylvania. It was women's college. She, at an early age, never saw the ocean, but she dreamed of it. She won a lot of essay, won prizes for writing, um, you know, stories about the natural world and magazines like St. Nicholas for young people. Um, she eventually makes her way to Johns Hopkins to do a master's in zoology. But her big moment, the Rachel Carson's first big epiphany in life, she got a fellowship to go to Woods Hole. Woods Hole is in Cape Cod, walking distance from the Kennedy compound. Woods Hole was the oceanographic um, vortex in, of studies in America. Yes, there are studies being done in Miami, but uh, beyond that, and some in California, there is nothing like Woods Hole. Maybe there isn't today. Today, in Texas now, we have, you know, University of Texas is at Port Aransas, or, you know, Texas A&M is in Corpus Christi, and we're doing marine studies. Carson went there, got really interested in things like eels, the migratory journey of eels across the ocean into rivers. And she started writing books and articles, but, and, and she worked for U.S. Fish and Wildlife. She worked for FDR. During World War II, Rachel Carson's war effort was doing radio broadcasts for the government about the oceans, and particularly about our fish stocks, what's going on with the shad, you know, what's going on with our crab populations. Many of her articles would appear in the Baltimore Sun, and in 1946, she started a booklet series, you know, about FDR with the WPA guides in World War II, about all regions. She started doing and organizing WPA-like guides. They were called Conservation in Action for the government on all these wildlife refuges that we had around the country. And she then writes her first book, and, and, um, and, and, and to cut to the chase, by the late 40s to the, through the 50s, she wrote three books about our oceans that were mega bestsellers. Not kind of, not like on the list a couple of weeks and disappears. Week after week, everybody believed that, that nobody had ever written about oceans with the poetic beauty, scientific exactness of Rachel Carson. Um, she was a phenom. Any of you that have any interest in ocean life would have encountered her. The only competition was Anne Lindbergh um, Morrow down in Sanibel Island, Florida, who wrote a best-selling book, but that was like um, you know, a, a lower uh, quality product. Rachel Carson was nailing these incredible um, uh, ocean books. And you know who was a big, big fan of hers? Rose Kennedy, John F. Kennedy's mother. John F. Kennedy's mom was raised in Concord, Massachusetts with Walden Pond as her backyard. And you all know Walden Pond is Henry, is Henry David Thoreau's um, famous place. In fact, I ask students sometimes and people, what's your Walden Pond? What's your Walden Pond? Meaning what place in the spiritual, natural world most speaks to you? It might be your grandmother's house, backyard. It might be a state park. It might be a river. But I ask you as an audience, what's your Walden? Well, Rose Kennedy's Walden was Walden. And when she moved and got married and in Boston and then went to, um, she ended up, you know, famously in Hyannisport, all of the Kennedy kids with Rose learned to swim, not in the ocean, but in Walden Pond. Rose Kennedy was such a Thoreauvian that she made a special secret mission working with CIA to check all over Russia to see if Thoreau's books were being carried in libraries. 
Thoreau didn't just write Walden. He wrote another book that gets forgotten that I love called Cape Cod. And Thoreau also wrote The Maine Woods. And Thoreau also wrote an essay called Walking, which Rose Kennedy had memorized practically. And Ted Kennedy had parts of it memorized late in his life. He had still had recall of it. And the big line in Henry David Thoreau's walking essay was, in wildness is the preservation of the world. In wildness is the preservation of the world. And Thoreau said, every community needs what we might call today green belts, township parks. We've got to stay connected to the natural world and not be so arrogant that we're going to conquer nature, but we're going to live in harmony with it. And by the time in the 1950s when Rachel Carson's books were that big and Rose Kennedy found them, that there was no bigger Thoreauvian than Rachel Carson. She died in Silver Spring, Maryland in 1964 with Walden at her bedside. She'd had Thoreau posted on her desk. Thoreau in the, 19, um, in the 1950s became the inspiration for a wilderness movement in the United States. And the wilderness movement came to maturity and Dinosaur National Monument in Colorado, Utah, when they were the Bureau of Reclamation, which is part of Interior Department, was going to build a dam. But the dam would have ruined part of Dinosaur National Monument. And the protest to it was you're not, it'll there in the National Park bylaws, you're not allowed to destroy or mar a national park which monuments are part of that system, a unit. And a King Daddy fight occurred in the mid-1950s. Bernard DeVoto, the lead, he died of a heart attack, but was a uh, writing for Harper's Magazine. David Brower, who was running the Sierra Club. Um, Howard Zonizer, who was running the Wilderness Society. They got aggressive in the mid-50s to stop the dam. And they won. And that victory inspired a, that whole wilderness movement. Now you also had an anti-nuclear movement being born. Norman Cousins, who I mentioned, creates SANE, S-A-N-E, stopping of nuclear testing and underwater and, or um, in the atmosphere. So you have the anti-nuclear commoner cousins crowd coming. You're having the wilderness lobby of modern day Thoreauvians coming to the fruition, and you have Rachel Carson doing wildlife refuges, but with the interest of oceans, and they all morph together. John F. Kennedy, who was a playboy senator, not a workhorse, due to William O. Douglas, Supreme Court Justice, Kennedy family friend, got Jack involved with national seashore protection. And John F. Kennedy makes a huge mark for himself in the Senate in the late 50s, promoting Cape Cod National Seashore. What's important about saving Cape Cod, which Kennedy accomplishes first year in president in 1961, is that it's not a national park like Yellowstone. Cape Cod is a national park where the communities of Wellfleet and Turo, Provincetown are interacting with the park. And that becomes another big motion. How do we create saving park zones where people can live within boundaries or around it in new and innovative ways? Carson, at this point, after writing her Sea Trilogy, started getting dumps of documents. She had worked, as I mentioned, in U.S. Fish and Wildlife. All of these government scientists started saying, Rachel, Look at what DDT is doing to the fish in our test. Look what it's doing to birds. Look what it'll do to human health. And she took all of this raw data in a whistleblower-like fashion and started crafting it into the book that is Silent Spring. In Silent Spring, she works on in the late 50s while she has breast cancer, while she's very sick, while she's going through radiation treatment, she's wearing, having to wear a wig for losing all of her, her hair, and she starts writing this manifesto. No book in American history 
has had the wallop and the impact of Silent Spring. The New York Times just asked me that, and I had to make a list of ones that had that kind of impact, something like Thomas Paine's Common Sense in the American Revolution, maybe Zebulon Pike's Wilderness Exploration Diaries when they were entered into the congressional record, certainly The Jungle by Upton Sinclair uh, for Meatpacking Industries, but Carson's book that she was working on um, finally got launched in, um, in the early 1962 with um, excerpts published in The New Yorker. What Rachel Carson had going for her beyond these movements coming together was the man I mentioned, Justice William O. Douglas. Douglas was from Yakima, Washington, could barely walk because of polio as a boy, became the hero, legal, brilliant mind of Columbia Law School, went on to be the Sterling Professor at Yale Law School, and Douglas goes on to being the longest serving Supreme Court Justice in U.S. history. Keep in mind, in the period I'm talking about right now, post-war America, there is no sewage treatment plants. There is no Environmental Protection Agency. There is no Clean Air Act. There is no Clean Water Act. So these activists that are coming together from different walks of life are starting to imagine a world that we're all living in right now, but we weren't back then. And um, Ke uh, Douglas says that it's the Uncle Tom's cabin, Rachel Carson, what it meant to Lincoln and the abolitionist. This book's gonna mean to this new wave of conservationists or what we call environmentalists today. And the New Yorker excerpts called, and it caused an explosion because the chemical manufacturers were now had their, they were being backed up with real science. And they called her a spinster, hysterical, lesbian, any name you can think was thrown at Rachel Carson to try to smear her um, because she had, had no children, although she took care of her nephew. Um, and they were, it, it just vicious stuff. And yet, while she's being hammered and she's standing up with the New Yorker for her research, John F. Kennedy at the podium, at a question says, I'm gonna look into this pesticides due to, um, due to um, the book by Ms. Car, or the, the research found by Ms. Carson. And Kennedy orders a presidential science advisory committee to look into her findings. He picked the right scientists, the best scientists. Just like in climate change today, we have climate experts. And they said Carson was right, DDT will poison people. And it wasn't just DDT. It was all of formaldehyde, misforming babies, and all of these hocus pocus, chemical, you know, Aladdin's lamp, presto, all these uh, things that were, weren't vetted due to the hurry up mentality of World War II were now causing a problem. Carson's book comes out in the fall of 62, and life's never the chain, uh, is never the same in America because Carson is telling every one of you, it, up until Rachel Carson, conservation was what Theodore Roosevelt was doing. Let's save a national forest, or let's save a monument, Devil's Tower in Wyoming, or let's save Mammoth Cave in Kentucky. Kind of heirloom stuff. Rachel Carson is saying, your son and daughter are getting sick playing in your backyard. The problem with DDT was it was being aerial sprayed. And the big legal case in the late 1950s was led by Marjorie Spock. And Marjorie Spock was an organic farmer on Long Island who sued all the way to the Supreme Court. And Marjorie Spock, whose brother was Dr. Benjamin Spock, the famous baby doctor. But Marjorie Spock said, I have a right to grow organic produce. How come a Suffolk County or Long Island or New York or U.S. Department of Agriculture can spray chemicals over my organic acreage? She said, that I have a right to be an organic farmer. Who owns that airspace? Lawyers in the audience will know, you know, what a conundrum an issue like that is. Who's owning the airspace above our, you know? 
And she lost in the Supreme Court. But William O. Douglas wrote an extraordinary dissent, um, and, and which is also with Silent Spring, the opening bell of the environmental movement. Meanwhile, while she is hitting this sort of notoriety, Kennedy saves not just Cape Cod National Seashore, Padre Island here in Texas National Seashore, Point Reyes out in California. Um, he pushes for a wilderness act. That's the wilderness lobby I was talking about, the Thorovians. This is like Robert Frost is part of this. Secretary of Interior Stuart Udall is part of this. You guys have wilderness. Look on a map. In 1964, Lyndon Johnson saved 9.1 million acres, but we have a massive wilderness preservation system in this country. Some wilderness units bigger than West Virginia right in Montana, like the Bob Marshall up there, or the Ansel Adams in California now. Wilderness is no roads. Roads are, that the idea of wilderness is some land you gotta save where humans don't encroach. You build a road, you're gonna get, tele you're gonna get telephones, you're gonna get sewage lines, you're gonna get timber trucks. So you have to leave vast swaths of wilderness alone. Kennedy's pushing that hard. He doesn't get it done, but on his death, LBJ signs the Wilderness Act into law. Secretary of Interior Stuart Udall of the Kennedy Johnson years, go to the Interior Department in Washington today. It's named the Stuart Udall um, building. He was the most powerful and important Interior Secretary in U.S. history. And he writes a book modeled on Rachel Carson called The Quiet, the, um, Quiet Crisis. And so by the time JFK is killed in Dallas, this movement is underfoot. As Udall says, Kennedy let the doors crack open and all of these, what today you would call climate activists, environmentalists, preservationists, you know, um, anti-extinction people, whatever you want to call it, came pouring in the door. And LBJ is there as president, a little overwhelmed by it, but he goes with it because he has enough senators to go with it. You know, when you have 67 senators, you can get legislation done. I'm sure some of you have been to the Lyndon Johnson Presidential Library. They're just massive walls filled with signing pens of LBJ. And all of these groups like the Sierra Club or Audubon Societies all have these measures coming, LBJ signing them away. And you know who's cheerleading them on? Lady Bird Johnson who's synonymous with conservation, beautification, no billboards, um, parks. And when Rachel Carson dies of her cancer, Kennedy's dead in, in, in November 63, Carson's gone in April of 64. The wave effect, Lady Bird becomes, starts becoming the voice of the national parks. She goes rafting down the Rio Grande here in Big Bend she stands in the redwood groves and says, we're gonna save them. And she becomes more popular than Lyndon on promoting this. I would say outside of Eleanor Roosevelt, if I had to rank first ladies, LB, uh, Lady Bird's very high, which she did for conservation in her era. And meanwhile, Lyndon Johnson's created things one after the other, places that maybe you haven't gotten to see, but North Cascades National Park in Washington State, Redwoods National Park in California, Canyonlands in Utah. Kennedy and Johnson create a whole new category called Lakeshore, National Lakeshores, and safe places like the Indiana Dunes in Indiana outside of Chicago, Sleeping Bear Dunes in Michigan, Picture Island in Michigan, the Apostle Islands in Wisconsin. I could go on and on saying the Great Lakes need to be preserved. They're also starting to look at environmental quality. And I don't know if any of you know the name William Ruckel's house, but he's most remembered for Watergate uh, as standing up to Nixon. But Ruckel's house was from Indiana and an incredible environmentalist who died a few years ago, first head of the EPA. And Ruckel's house told me the problem with guys like me writing books like this is we all love to do parks. And he said, the big story of the 60s is sewage treatment. And nobody wants to be the sewage scholar. 
you know, writing about landfill scholars. They do now. It's a hot field and environmental university press books coming out. But for a long time, people didn't go, I'm going to do my PhD in Yale and study this history of sewage. Um, but our country didn't have sewage treatment. We were dumping raw everything into our waterways. In a way, I mean, we talk about the Dust Bowl of the 30s. You talk about America in the 60s. 1969, the Cuyahoga River catches fire in Ohio. Cover of Time magazine. They just happened to choose the Cuyahoga. I mean, the, Ro the, the Rouge River in Detroit had been on fire before that. That's how polluted and dirty these rivers are, that they could become a wall of fire going across them. Um, and so the uh, and LBJ, tied to Vietnam War, passes the first Endangered Species Act in 1966. In the back of my book, I have the list of the first animals. They were looking for chrismatic species to save. They chose the key deer, a little deer in Florida. It never quite took off. But by the second Endangered Species Act that Nixon signs, it's really about the bald eagle because the bald eagle was almost going extinct. It was vanishing like the dodo bird due to DDT, due to the thinning of eggshells and the poisoning of the fish streams. And so um, Lyndon Johnson on his way out in 68, that tumultuous year, you know, he creates things like the wild and scenic or, or national scenic trail system, saving the Appalachian Trail and the Pacific uh, Crest Trail. Um, you know, just there's one achievement after the other with LBJ and Lady Bird. Now you come in and say, look, I write in 68 about a writer, Edward Abbey's book, Desert Solitaire, or the Whole Earth Catalog and Stuart Brand and a, a, a renewed consciousness of, of indigenous people, culture in the land, beat generation writers, Allen Ginsberg and Gary Snyder talking about ecology. Um, but it's really kicking in. Two battles I write about in the book, I won't go in detail, just tell you one's the Hudson River campaign to save Storm King from Con Edison, another is to stop a, a power plant, nuclear power plant in Bodega Bay, California. The environmentalists win both. The motto that's developed in 1967 by the environmental movement is sue the bastards. Um, that's begun by the Environmental Defense Fund, but today it's the National Resource Defense Council, Sierra Club Defense Fund, meaning in a society like this, you're only, if you have those kinds of uh, lawsuits, are you going to be able to affect legislative change? I'm not saying I agree with that, but I'm telling you that was a big, big movement. Others said, we'll do it in legislature, and it was bipartisan. Now, when Nixon comes in, in 69, you'd say, well, Nixon's not an environmentalist. He wasn't. I call him at best a reluctant environmentalist. But he had a house in San Clemente. And he's only president days when the Santa Barbara oil spill hits. And where California Republicans, his donors, had big fancy homes in Laguna Beach and Newport, and they're screaming bloody murder. I've read the letters to Nixon. Do something about it. Our whole shoreline's getting destroyed by this oil spill. So he's constituent politics, puts an ear to it and deals with it. Then the Cuyahoga th that summer, and Gaylord Nelson, senator for Wisconsin, is really hatching the idea of the first Earth Day. But do you know who's funding Earth Day? Who funds it? The big one, 1970 Earth Day. Walter Ruther, head of the labor leader of the United Auto Workers, Ruther was the biggest environmental voice of the 60s and 70s, a labor union leader, writing checks to Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta in California fighting environmental justice issues, particularly pesticides, like Rachel Carson warned, warned about, hurting uh, farm workers. And Martin Luther King dies, gets shot in Memphis in a garbage sanitation strike. These are the birth of what we call today environmental justice or Chavez and King, urban centers, because wherever people of color lived, that became a dumping zone. Uh, the poor, the, the real estate, the poor, the neighborhood, we were bur burying our toxic sludge and debris and kids were getting sick and people were dying in Houston. 
People were dying in Fort Myers, Florida. People were dying in San Antonio from these sort of contaminants. And Nixon's smart enough. Nixon says this. First off, his big advisor is John Ehrlichman, domestic Watergate. Do you realize Ehrlichman was a water and land environmental lawyer in Seattle before he entered the Nixon domestic advisor? He was the NIMBY guy you would hire if you were rich in Puget Sound and didn't like a, he stopped an aluminum factory from being built near wealthy people. Nixon went and visited him in the early 1960s and was amazed that he could make a business out of environmental law. Not only that, Nixon didn't know any, didn't care for environmentalists, so when he needed one, when he ran for president, said, John, will you be my environmentalist? And he did well, Ehrlichman, with the press, and suddenly Nixon put him as domestic advisor in the White House and told Ehrlichman, I want nothing to do with the environment. You deal with all that crap. Ehrlichman, by people like the Sierra Club and others, is called a covert green, believe it or not, um, because he was getting this legislation. Who was he getting legislation from for Nixon? Henry M. Jackson, Scoop Jackson of Washington. Washington State was pro, Jackson was pro-Vietnam War and even stood by Nixon through Cambodia and Laos. And Nixon loathed liberals, loathed progressives meaning he disdained George McGovern and Eugene McCarthy and Ted Kennedy and Gaylord Nelson and Frank Church and Ed Muskie. He despised Ed Muskie, Nixon. So Jackson was like John Conley of Texas, who Nixon liked, a Democrat he liked, because Scoop's not taken to the microphone and denouncing my administration. And so Scoop hires the best, smartest environmental lawyer types you could imagine and starts cobbling out these laws. And on New Year's Day, January 1, 1970, Nixon at San Clemente signs the Jackson and Dingell of Michigan, Congressman John Dingell, and creates NEPA, National Environmental Policy Act. That's the game changer. NEPA is what makes any business, corporation, real estate per person have to have an environmental impact statement. It has had a very uh, a dramatic change in behavior in the United States. And then not only following that, Nixon after NEPA, seeing Earth Days coming, April 22nd, 1970, gives the most progressive environmental speech of any president, Richard Nixon's State of the Union Address, 1970. It'll blow your mind if you read it. You, Bill McKibben couldn't have written it. Uh, um, it's that green. And that Earth Day, the whole world turned into the environmental movement. And you have songs like, you know, um, you know people like Joan Baez and Pete Seeger, but also Marvin Gaye, you know, Mercy Me, The Ecology, um, you, you had a wave of popular culture talking about ecology, environment. Schools have to teach ecology and environment. It was a movement. It was Rachel Carson's revolution. And it's Nixon and Ehrlichman and Ruckelshaus who banned DDT at last, 10 years after Rachel Carson wrote the book uh, in Silent Spring Revolution. It gets banned in North America um, for usage. Um, and not only that, Nixon, always thinking about getting reelected in 1972, says, I'm going to out musky musky on the environment. And he creates the Environmental Protection Agency. It opens its doors in December 1970. EPA is law enforcement. Its job is to bust polluters, people breaking the law. And not only EPA, Nixon creates NOAA. When you hear about NOAA today or doing research on our atmosphere and all, Nixon creates NOAA in 1970. Nixon signs the most progressive Clean Air Act of 1970. That's still, I don't know where we'd be as a country with emission standards. Nixon starts pushing to get lead out of gasoline and is successful. And when I say Nixon, it means it's become bipartisan, guys. Something you're not seeing with climate change right now. It's a bipartisan movement 
that's, that took a hold of the United States. It culminates really in 1972 with the Clean Water Act. And you have Republicans like Howard Baker of Tennessee and others as real environmentalists. And Nixon's last act, Endangered Species Act of 73, I saw the beautiful Andy Warhol um, gallery here, uh, which is just remarkable of, of um, you know, everybody from Groucho Marx to um, Kafka here at the temple. And the uh, Warhol would do a whole series of endangered species. Incidentally, a Texas painter, Robert Rauschenberg's the one who did the first Earth Day poster. Um, it's a rich history. But what happens is 73 is the end. What happens in 73? Why would all of this fervent energy, environmentalism, boom? A few things happen. One is called the Arab oil embargo. People got angry of high gasoline and inflation, and they boycotted the Arab countries to the United States. Um, what made Nixon got turned on by conservatives in his own party for being too green, too in bed with the left. There was also suddenly people realized NEPA and EPA, what it really meant if you were in the extraction business or the chemical business. It meant federal regulation, federal regulation, federal regulation. Um, but something else happened. In 1972, a man named Lewis Powell became Supreme Court Justice, a Republican. In 1971, Powell writes a famous memo to the Chambers of Commerce telling them we've got to stop Rachel Carsonism, meaning we've got to stop the federal regulations or capitalism will die. And they create the business roundtable. It's the beginning of corporations opening offices in Washington, D.C. to do lobbying. It's the beginning of the Heritage Foundation, the American Enterprise Institute, Cato, Pick your, your conservative action group and you'll see that they're being born out of the Powell memo as a rejection of environmentalism. Because things like race and gender can be debated, but environmentalism was busting companies at their bottom line. William O. Douglas was arguing in the Supreme Court that trees and rocks have standing in court. This went, was going far. And they, you naturally had the conservative counterswing. And Powell says it'll take decades, but we've got to shut down the universities from public speaking forums. We're going to have to create our own media, which is the Fox News phenomenon of today. We're going to have to create our own think tanks and spe conservative speaking bureaus. The left, Ralph Nader and these types have had such a run that it may take us 10, 15, 20 years, but we will win if we stand firm and unite around business principles and say no to these EPA hyper-regulated, meaning, and this is instantly where the Coors people and the Koch brothers come from. All of this is a rejection against the Rachel Carson revolution in the 60s. I end my book with all of these characters I carry throughout are gone. Lady Bird's long gone, Lyndon gone, Nixon gone, only like Ralph Nader's around. Um, and you know, that, that whole generation has passed, but we've been living on that revolution in the environmental world now. And the question is, three progressive eras, are we on the cusp of a fourth, a climate change revolution? and you're starting to see it take hold in the universities. It's young people right now that are putting climate on the top of the political agenda. Thank you.